hopefully everybody has brought his and her new cat. Just very quickly start with the seven sacraments and very briefly say what is the role or the function of every sacrament. If you go to article or question number 193, 193, these do not refer to pages, they refer to the questions. So question uh, 100, uh, sorry, 193. Just to an overview of the seven sacraments of the church, the seven channels of grace by which God's life comes into us and sanctifies us. So, is there some inner logic that unites the sacraments with each other? What is the union or the relationship of the sacrament to each other? So question 193. Have you got it all? Okay. It says all sacraments are an encounter with Christ, who is himself the original sacrament. There are sacraments of initiation, which introduce the faithful, the recipient, into the faith. Now, there are three, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. There are sacraments of healing, reconciliation, that we call also confession or penance, and the anointing of the sick. And there are sacraments of communion and mission, the sacrament of matrimony, when a man and a woman give their lives to each other in the presence of God in his church. So this is the sacrament of matrimony, holy orders. It's when a man is called to be a priest or a bishop or a deacon. Now, the explanation is very, very important. What comes next? Baptism joins us with Christ. Of course, it's, it's more than that. You know, very quickly in baptism, when we're baptized, we are baptized what we call into the death and the resurrection of Christ. When we are in water, when we go down, when we're immersed in water, we kind of die with Christ. And when we emerge from water, we rise with Christ. So, in so doing, by baptism, we're united to Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. And the bond that linked us with our first parents, Adam and Eve, you know, they're the original sin, the sin of our first parents is cut off by the death and resurrection of Christ when we unite ourselves in baptism to Christ, this bond, this link to original sin is cut off. So we become new creations. And we become part of God's family. God's family, that is the church. And we, becoming part of the church, we become also temples. We become houses of God. God lives in us. You know, He lives in us and He fills our lives with His presence. So as I mentioned to you before, it's amazing what baptism followed by confirmation and then Eucharist does in our lives. It makes us tabernacles. You know what tabernacle is? When you go to Mass, in every Catholic church, you got this big, heavy, usually gold-plated box that is, you know, uh, that is in the sanctuary, that is usually at the center where the priest keeps the body of Christ. So we become like, you know, houses of God, like this tabernacle. So we become, imagine, we become holy. That means baptism by 
cutting us off from original sin also forgives all our personal sins are forgiven. Now, when a baby is baptized, he doesn't baby doesn't have personal sins, but there's original sin. He's tainted, he's marked by original sin. So in baptism, the mark or the taint of the stain of original sin is removed. We're no longer connected by original sin to our first parents. But when an adult is baptized, not only this connection with original sin is cut off, but his personal sins are forgiven. And then when we're confirmed, let's go, let's continue. Baptism joins us with Christ. Confirmation gives us his spirit, the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit is not just the force. Okay, you know, who said, who saw Star Wars? Raise your hand. Okay, you didn't see Star Wars? <laughs> well, just, uh, you know, get the DVD and see it, the whole series. <laughs> so, we don't believe in the force or the energy. Ooh, there's so much energy energy. Can't you feel the energy? Ooh, I feel it. You know, I got goosebumps, but you can't see them because of my habit. Anyways, no, no. When the Holy Spirit is God, is God, and what does the Holy Spirit do exactly? It's holy. It brings God's holiness in us. The Holy Spirit, St. Paul says, and the church says, makes us proclaim Jesus is Lord, not only by with our lips, but in our all our lives. Jesus is Lord. That means I place every dimension of my life, I place my mind, my will, my heart, my emotions, I place my body, my sexuality, I place uh, my memory, I place my past, you know, everybody has been hurt in his past. You know, nobody can say, I have never been hurt. Some people are hurt from early age. So we carry a lot of hurts. So when we place our past under the Lordship of Christ, we allow him to go into our past and heal us and set us free. Because remember that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's risen from the dead. He's the Lord of time. He's the Lord of history. That means he's the Lord of your time and your history. So when I say, when the Holy Spirit says to us, makes us say, Jesus is Lord, my whole life in all its dimension is under the Lordship of so I can say, Jesus not only is Lord of all the universe, Jesus is my Lord. It's not enough to say Jesus is Lord. But if Jesus is not your Lord yourself, you've got an objective truth, which is very important, Jesus is Lord, but you don't have, you have not integrated this truth into your life. So you've got to be able to say, Jesus is my Lord. Remember St. Thomas, doubting Thomas, who didn't see Jesus. You know, when he, when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to the eleven, Thomas was not there. So they told Thomas, we have seen the risen Lord is alive. He said, unless I put my finger in his Unless I see him, unless I put my finger in his wounds, I will not believe. So the second week, Thomas is with the other eleven. And Jesus comes again, risen from the dead. And says, Thomas, come. Touch, touch me. Come and see me. And so what did Thomas say? He said, my Lord and my God. He didn't say, Lord, you are the Lord of the universe. 
Jesus is. And he said, my Lord and my God. So the Holy Spirit makes, brings God's holiness in our life. So that means I cannot stand to lie. I cannot stand to commit any sin, big or small. I feel like murdering Daniel. No, I want to kill him. I hate him. But the Holy Spirit, no, no. Daniel is your brother. you got to love him. And it's only the Holy Spirit that gives us the grace and power to love our enemies. See, this is the test of you and I being true Christians. Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray those who hate you. Pray for those who hate you. Do good to those who persecute you. Now, our sinful nature, our wounded nature says, oh, no, no, ignore those who you do not like. I hate this person, I ignore her. I hate my manager. Oh, she's such a stupid one. No, no. Jesus says, if the Holy Spirit is truly in your heart, love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. Um, pray for those who persecute you. That's the only, it's only possible by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the power of God. The power for what? To love as Jesus loved. Jesus, how did he love? He died for, his, for the good and for the bad. He died for everybody, for his enemies. He took all our sins away. And so the Holy Spirit makes us brings into our lives the power of God to be holy and to love like Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit also gives us courage. They're what we call their seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that we receive when we're confirmed. And one of those gifts is called courage or fortitude, which means, you know, when Let's say at your workplace, somebody makes fun of Catholics or Christians, makes fun of them. Gosh, I was like, oh, we still believe in God. It's so stupid. They're so deranged, you know. They believe in God. Oh, let's go. Let's go, guys, to a strip joint, you know. The gift of the Holy Spirit called courage or forty you said, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Because for me, Jesus Christ is the center of my life. He's my Lord. And I can't just go with you. I can tell you that Jesus can only change your life. Oh, no, forget it. You're stupid, you know. So the Holy Spirit makes us courageous, strong in witnessing to Christ. And sometimes in accepting persecution. Now, the early Christians, the first four centuries, when Christians were arrested, tortured, sent to the lion, do you think they were heroes? No, they were like you and me, wimps, cowards. But then when it came to witness to Christ, the Holy Spirit was so much alive in their lives that they faced even the death by mutilation, torture, by the by the wild animals, by, you know, lions, you know. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the strength and the courage to be a witness. And sometimes, in certain cases, to die for Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always, as I mentioned to you before, when we talked about the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the love of the Father and the Son. You know, in eternity, God, God is not alone in His loneliness. He's not worshiping Himself. You know, like Narcissus. You know the myth of Narcissus? The guy who's in Greek mythology who looked, you know, in a pond. He saw himself. Oh, I'm so 
I'm so beautiful. You know, he worshipped himself so much that he said, it's not worth living because I don't want anybody to take away the love and worship for myself. No, God is not narcissist. Narcissus. God is eternal embrace. It's like a family, but it's much more than a family. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's one God, no three gods. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God with three divine persons. And in heaven and in all eternity, the Father eternally loves the Son, and the Son returns the love of the Father, and that mutual love is the Holy Spirit. And it's a mystery. It, it just mind boggling. Our little tiny boxes here cannot understand the fullness of this truth of our faith. We call it mystery, the mystery of the Trinity. And so that love is a personal love. It's not force. Energy. Ooh, no. It's a person. It's God, the Holy Spirit. And so in the sacrament of confirmation, you receive the Holy Spirit. And so some people, there's a, there's a problem with confirmation. We'll talk about it. Let's continue here. So baptism joins us with Christ. Confirmation gives us His Spirit. The Eucharist, the greatest of all sacraments, the blessed sacrament, the holy sacrament. The Eucharist unites us with Christ. So what's the most important thing that we live when we go to Mass? First of all, we're not alone. Me, Jesus, Jesus, and me. I don't give a damn about others, no. When we go to Mass, we are with all the people of God. There's babies crying, <laughs> people sneezing, and then all sorts of sounds, you know. But that's the church. There are couples with their children, there are elderly people, there are people who are handicapped, disabled, there are people who are crazy, there are people who are intellectuals, there are people who are uneducated, there are people who stink, there's people who smell perfume. There's people who burp, you know, I'm just going to, there's all sorts of people. This is the church. And the church is not a club of people, you know, who have PhDs and are good, well-mannered and, you know, smell well, nice, have good words, you know. No, no, no. The church is the assembly of sinners who recognize that they are sinful and that they need God's love and God's holiness. And they come together from all walks of life, from all cultures. This is why the Catholic Church is not a sect. It is the church because it embraces all cultures and all people. This is why I delight, you know, three times a year Christmas, New Year, and Easter to say, you know, Merry Christmas or Happy New Year or Happy Easter in many languages. And at St. Mary's, we have many United Nations. We have more than 85 nationalities. So that's the church. So the Holy East, the Mass is you come with all these people. Some you know, some you don't know but they're all your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then you listen to the Word of God. When the Word of God is proclaimed in the Eucharist by the priest or the deacon, the gospel, you don't switch off. There's people who start snoring when the priest starts preaching. Or they keep their eyes open, but inside they're asleep. So, and then, after you listen to Christ through the priest in the gospel and the homily, then you go at the end to receive Christ Jesus in Holy Communion. The 
bread of life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will never die. He who eats my body and drink my blood will have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. So when you go there to receive him in Holy Communion, it's a tiny piece of bread. Is it possible that the God of the universe is in this tiny piece of bread? Is it possible? Of course it is. That's the beauty of our Catholic faith. That after the priest elevates, lifts up the bread and the wine, calls on the Holy Spirit to come on the bread and the wine and repeats the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, the words of consecration, this tiny piece of bread and this wine, which is not the best wine, it's not the Bordeaux or whatever, but it's a good wine, sweet as usual, become very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Isn't that mind-boggling for our little box here? It is. But that's our Catholic faith. Now, in the Middle Ages, they've asked many questions about the Eucharist. <laughs> Say, what if, what if a mouse goes, you know, if the, the priest forgets the tabernacle open, and a mouse gets into the tabernacle and steals a consecrated bread, the body of Christ. Does the mouse eat the body of Christ? Well, they debated it. They said, it is the body of Christ. Objectively, it is the body of Christ. But the mouse has not, has no faith. So she wouldn't, the mouse, it would not be able to say, ah, oh, that's the body of Christ. It is objectively the body of Christ. But the mouse will never be able to say, well, I have eaten the body of Christ. I'm, I'm a saint now. So it is the body of Christ. Objectively, it is. But you need to, by the gift of faith, to receive him also subjectively as the bread of life. And to allow him to unite you to himself. When you are united to the body of Christ by Holy Communion, you're united to all the members of the body of Christ, those who are alive and those who are dead. It's just mind-boggling, the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, when you receive the body of Christ, the early church fathers said, you receive fire of God's love. You become all on fire for God. You want to give your life to God. You want to go and witness to Him. You become bold. You become filled with His peace, with His joy. You know, that's the Eucharist. That's why it is the greatest of all the sacraments. And all the sacraments lead to the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is like a font where all the sacraments derive from. This is why the church teaches that the Eucharist is the source of the summit of our Christian life. Now, all the seven sacraments are connected to each other. And today, we're not speaking about the Eucharist, we're actually speaking about confirmation. So now, confirmation in your Eucat is, take now questions 203. From 203 to 207. What is confirmation? 203. Response, answer in bold letters. Confirmation is the sacrament that <coughs> completes baptism. In it, the gift of the Holy Spirit is bestowed upon us, is given to us. Anyone who freely decides to live a life as God's child and asks for God's spirit under the signs of the imposition of hands and anointing with chrism, we'll explain that, 
receive the strength to witness to God's love and might and power in word and deed. When the, when the baptized person is confirmed, he is now a full-fledged responsible member of the Catholic Church. Now I find the explanation after the bold, after the reply, the explanation is always very good. So, 203. It says, when a coach sends a soccer player onto the playing field, he puts his hand on his shoulder and gives him final instructions. We can understand confirmation in a similar way. A hand is placed upon us. You see that in confirmation, it's usually the, it's the bishop or the bishop delegates the priest. So confirmation is through two gestures. First, by the laying on of hands of the bishop or the priest. And then, after the laying on of hands, the bishop or the priest uses this special oil that was consecrated during Holy Week before Easter by the bishop called Holy Chrism. This oil is filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's called Holy Chrism. And this oil serves in three sacraments, in baptism, in confirmation, and when a man is called to be a priest or a bishop in holy orders. So after the laying on of hands by the bishop or the priest, you know, those who are going to be confirmed come forward and the priest or the bishop puts, anoints their forehead or their head with this holy chrism. Okay, so through a hand is placed upon us, we step out onto the field of life. Through the Holy Spirit, we know that we have to do. We know what we have to do. And we, and that we have been given the power to do it. He has motivated us. His mission, I mean, is the Holy Spirit in us. The mission of the Holy Spirit in us resounds in our ear. We sense His help. We will not betray His trust or disappoint Him. We will win the game for Him. We just have to want to do it and to listen to Him. Now, are there any traces in the Old Testament of the Sacrament of Confirmation? Now, when sometimes when you read the, the Old Testament and certain prophets, you see that you know, when God wants to use a man or a woman for a, its important work, He sends the Holy Spirit to fill them. He fills them with the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, remember Moses. Moses did everything for God. He brought the people out of Egypt. And, you know, and at one point, you know, he said, I'm too tired, you know. They're, the people are a rebellious people. I can't do God's work. I'm too, I'm only the only one. So God inspired him to call 70 men, 70 elders, to share the work of Moses. And when they, those 70 men, entered the tent where Moses was, the Holy Spirit came upon them. This was what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they had an experience, a strong experience. They started, as the Bible said, to prophesy. But there were two who were outside of the tent. So Moses' captain, you know, said, well, those two do not belong to us. They're not part of the tent. What do we do? Do we shut them up? So Moses told him, no. I pray that all God's people become prophets, and therefore receive the Holy Spirit. And so, in the Old Testament, there are traces of the coming of the Holy Spirit on certain people in order to do God's work. And there was the indication from the time of Moses 
who prayed that, I pray that all the people would receive the Holy Spirit and become prophets. And that was realized in the New Testament after the resurrection of Jesus on the Feast of Pentecost. So, let's see. We still have 10 minutes before we, we break to have some snack. Now, what does sacred scripture say about the sacrament of confirmation? This is question 204. In the Old Testament, the people of God expected the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Messiah. They were expecting a Savior, a Messiah. And they said, especially in the prophet Isaiah, that the Messiah will be filled with the Holy Spirit and his gifts. So they were expecting an outpouring, a descent of the Holy Spirit on the person of the Messiah. Jesus lived his life in a special spirit of love and of perfect unity with his Father in heaven. Remember that Jesus went to his cousin, John the Baptist, who was baptizing people with water. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, well, why are you coming? I need to be baptized by you, not you. And Jesus said, I need to fulfill all right. I need to be baptized, not for me, but for my people for the people. So when Jesus, you know, emerged from the water of baptism, there was a vision. The heavens were open, and a voice was heard, the voice of the Father. And then there was the Holy Spirit appeared like a dove descended on Jesus. Now, you may say, well, the voice of the Father was heard. This is my beloved Son. In him, I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove. They say that Jesus, being God, didn't need the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit. That's true. But here we're talking about the humanity of Jesus. Jesus, as the head, the head of the body, the church, Jesus in his sacred humanity received the Holy Spirit, was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Not for himself, but for us. So that we can and we would receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, in his humanity, received the Holy Spirit when he emerged from the waters of baptism for us. And the Holy Spirit, what did he do with him? He sent him to the wilderness, to the desert, to be tempted by Satan. Remember these scenes. And Jesus overcame the temptations of the devil. Now why did he overcome? So that we, the members of his body, can be overcomers. You know, sometimes, you know, in the face of sin, we become like wimps. Do you know what a wimp is? Raise your hand. Who knows what a wimp is? So can you define me a wimp, Kathleen? What is a wimp? A person who falls flat, you know, when you see sin coming, say, Ooh, Madame Sin, I fall flat, I accept you, Madame Sin, in my life. No, no, no. That's a whim, a weakling. Jesus overcame the devil so that we, the members of his body, can become overcomers. And unfortunately, we see so many Christians and Catholics, they live a defeated life in the face of temptation, the sin, fall flat. We're wimps. And this is where the Holy Spirit, in the sacrament of confirmation, when we receive the Holy Spirit, boy, we become courageous and bold and strong. We say, no way I'm going to yield to you. From now on, I'm not going to be a wimp anymore. Because the strength of Christ is in me. And the one who is in me, like St. Paul says, is so much stronger than the one who is in the world. That means the devil. So, and you say like Paul, St. Paul, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. How can you say this? Because you have the strength, the power of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit. 
So the Holy Spirit, through the sacrament of confirmation, gives you power against sin in your life and the life of others, in the life of society, at work. Instead of saying, I hate my boss, I wish she was dead, say, the Holy Spirit will tell you, no, pray for her. Do little things to show that you appreciate her. Pray for her so that she can become your sister or he can become your brother. So that's the Holy Spirit through the sacrament of confirmation. And so now we're going to take a break and bless the food. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we're about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, bon appétit. Now, in bold, you have the answer, and then you have the comment, commentary. In confirmation, the soul of a baptized Christian is imprinted with a permanent seal that can be received only once and marks the individual forever as a Christian. Let me give you an example. You want to have an official document you know, from the government or from the church that you were, you were confirmed or baptized. You know, you can get the government, the, the document, but it has to be stamped, it has to be sealed in order for the document to appear official, legal, and authentic. So when you are confirmed and you receive the Holy Spirit, the bishop or the priest, when he puts the holy chrism, when he anoints your forehead and your head with this special holy oil called holy tells you, he says, be sealed with the Holy Spirit, or receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. It's like God's sealing you, stamping you. You are mine from now on. You are a true Christian. You are a Catholic now, 100%. Of course, confirmation has to lead to the Eucharist, you know, because confirmation is not a sacrament that is separated from baptism and from the Eucharist. In the early church, up until the Middle Ages, and now what we do with adults who, who are not baptized, we always, the church always gave, gave, until maybe the Middle Ages, 13th century, they were, they baptized, confirmed, and then they gave the Eucharist. Now, in the Western Church, in our church, the Latin Rite Church, they, re when they realized that it would be good to distance the sacrament of confirmation from baptism because oftentimes they realized that if the family was not Christian, if the contest, and you know, the con confirmation with baptism and Eucharist did not produce the results of holiness of love that were expected. So the church at one point said, we're going to separate baptism and confirmation. We're going to give confirmation, not to the baby anymore, but we're going to give confirmation when the boy or the girl will start thinking and reflecting. So it could, it could be from age 12 to age 14, 15, so it depends. So it's only in our Latin church, <coughs> Western church, that confirmation is separated from baptism. But originally, and this is what we do with adults here, always, <coughs> you know, baptism was followed by confirmation and followed by Eucharist. And oftentimes during the Easter vigil, the celebration of Easter, the night of Easter, uh, preceding Easter, this is the greatest celebration of the year called the Easter vigil where adults are baptized, confirmed, and given the Eucharist. So, what happens?
is in confirmation. 205. In confirmation, the soul of a baptized Christian is imprinted with a permanent seal that can be received only once and marks this individual forever as a Christian. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the strength from above in which this individual puts the grace of his baptism into practice through his life and acts as a witness for Christ. Now the explanation after that, to be confirmed means to make a covenant with God. Now a covenant, I explained this word to you in your little dictionary. Remember a few weeks ago, I told you that as we're receiving the lessons here Thursday evening, you will start developing a vocabulary. You will understand what some big words, you know, mean. Covenant is a very important word in the whole Bible. Covenant is, is a pact, an agreement with God. Like when we do like this, let me hold your hand. That's a covenant. Yeah, but covenant is much more than this. In the Old Testament, when people united in covenants to one another, they would do this, but then they would seal this in blood. So they would, and they would put the blood, and that was sealed. You know, I'm your partner. God called his people to enter into covenant with him. So God promised, I will give you everything, but you'll have to be faithful to me, to my commandments, to my laws. And if you break the commandments, well, you know, you'll be punished. And so covenant was a, an agreement between God and his people through Moses and through the prophets, the patriarchs. We know that, you know, different covenants in the Old Testament. And in Jesus, it became more than an agreement. It became like a marriage. It became like a union of marriage. When we call in the New Testament, we call it also the New Covenant. That means in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through his life, death, and resurrection, God has entered with all who believe in him into a marriage bond, into a marriage relationship. So for example, when you go to the Eucharist to Mass, and receive Christ in Holy Communion, he unites himself to you. And you, you experience this covenant, this marriage bond, this union that is so strong that God is uniting him, you to himself in a, in a relationship of love, of fidelity, permanent relationship. So this is the word covenant. It's a very, very important word in the Bible. So, to be confirmed means to make a covenant with God. The one who is confirmed, it's called the confirm, confirmand, the one who is going to be confirmed, says, he says to God, you know, himself, yes, I believe in you, my God. Give me your Holy Spirit so that I might belong entirely to you and never be separated from you and may witness to you throughout my whole life, body and soul, in my words and deeds, on good days and bad. And God says to the one who's getting confirmed, yes, I believe in you too, my child, and I will give you my spirit, my very self. I will belong entirely to you. I will never separate myself from you in this life or eternally in the next. I will be in your body and your soul, in your words and deeds. Even if you forget me, I will still be there on good days and bad. So it's as if there's a conversation between God and the one who's getting confirmed. There's an exchange. You know, that's the covenant of confirmation. You know. 206, who can be confirmed? 
And what is required of a candidate for confirmation? In order to be confirmed, well, you have to be baptized. Any Catholic Christian or any Christian who has been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and who received the preparation, any Catholic Christian or any Christian who is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who has received the sacrament of baptism and is in the state of grace, can be admitted to confirmation. Like you cannot be admitted to confirmation if you say, well, there's nothing wrong in me. I have no sin. Oh, well, maybe sometimes I cheat, sometimes I lie, sometimes I, I cheat on my wife, sometimes I cheat on the government, sometimes I hate, sometimes I curse, but I have no sin. That means you're blind. <clears throat> And there's still blindness, spiritual blindness in you. And in order to be confirmed, you've got to realize sincerely that inside of you, there's wounds, there's hurts, there's sins, and that you need to repent of them. And how do you repent of them? When you go, if you're baptized already, it, when you go to confession, you go to see a priest in the sacrament of confession, you say, well, Father, you know, I hate my boss, and I get very angry, and I hurt others, and, uh, you know, sometimes I steal here and there little things, and sometimes I curse, and, you know, I don't forgive, you know, there's resentment in my heart, so I ask God's forgiveness, you know, I ask you to, I ask the Lord to. Forgive me and fill me with new life. So the priest gives you penance and he tells, speaks to you a little bit, gives you some advice, spiritual advice. And he says, I, now you, you say your act of contrition, you learn the act of contrition, so you've been written, the confessional, and then he says to you, um, God the Father of mercies through the death and the resurrection of his son has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God forgive you. May God give you pardon and peace. And I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when your sins are forgiven, you are in a state of grace. And then you can be confirmed. If you're baptized, say, oh, okay, I'm, I have no sin. I'm, 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 I'm nearly perfect. You're not ready. You're not in a state of grace. So you're not ready for confirmation. Now, what if you're not baptized? Well, if you want to be baptized, and you say, well, I have nothing to reproach. You know, I, I'm very good. I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. You know, sometimes I watch pornography, but I still love my wife. Sometimes I, I steal a little bit at work. Sometimes I, I get angry with my children. Sometimes... You know, I gamble, you know, sometimes I go to the casinos, you know, well, what's the week I spent, I mean, five hundred dollars, not more than that, you know, so far. And um, I hate those, those lazy, dumb, you know, who are with their dogs and, you know, asking for money. I hate them. They should all, you know, send them in prisons or burn them alive, you know, like the Nazis do. And I'm perfect. I am sick means that you're not ready to be baptized. Because if you want to be baptized, you have to realize that you need God's forgiveness. That God wants to heal you to forgive your sins. And so you come to baptism with a desire to be holy, to be like Jesus, to be forgiven. Now when you are baptized, you receive the forgiveness of sin. But if you don't have this repentance in your heart, even if you're baptized. It's not magic. You know, sometimes people think that once you're baptized, okay, all my sins are forgiven. But it's not magic. You have to have a spirit of repentance, which means, Lord, without you, you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot be good. I cannot be holy. I am sin. I have, I'm sinful. So I'm coming to baptism with that desire to be transformed by you, 
to be a changed person. Now, this is the right attitude to enter into baptism. So, the state of grace is very important. Now, who can be confirmed and what is required of a candidate for confirmation? Any Catholic Christian who has received the sacrament of baptism and is in the state of grace can be admitted to confirmation. Explanation. To be in the state of grace means not to have committed any serious or mortal sin. By a serious sin, a person separates himself from God and can be reconciled with God only by making good confession to a priest. A young Christian who is preparing for confirmation finds himself in one of the most important phases of his life. Like usually, people are confirmed around the age of 14, 15, 14, let's say. That's a young, a young uh, Christian. So, you know, at this age, it's a very delicate, it's full of energy, full of temptations, full, 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 you know. So, a young Christian who's preparing for confirmation finds himself in one of the most important phases of his life. He will do everything possible to grasp, to understand the faith with his heart and his understanding. He will pray alone and with others to receive the Holy Spirit. He will reconcile himself in every way with himself, with people around him, and with God. Confession is part of this, since it brings one closer to God, even if one has committed a mortal sin. Now, 207, who may confirm? The sacrament of confirmation is normally given, administered by the bishop, for reasons the bishop cannot be everywhere. You know, usually confirmation takes place during the Easter Vigil or for those who are already baptized, you know, uh, 14, 15 years of age in May, usually. You know, they, here in this parish, the bishop comes usually during the month of May and we get all the children from the school who are, you know, who have been prepared, who have already been baptized, but who have been prepared in prep school or, you know, they are in a Catholic high school. So they come to be uh, confirmed by the bishop. But the bishop delegates, he asks the parish priests to confirm those who are, you know, who need confirmation, the adults, during the Easter vigil, the night just before Easter. So you see, Father, for those of you who have seen already, Father Pierre, you know, brings, you know, during the Easter Vigil, all those who are called to be baptized, confirmed, and receive the Eucharist, those who are only be, need to be confirmed and receive communion. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I've told you about it before. And so this takes place during the Easter Vigil. Now, finally, um, so it's usually the bishop, but the bishop cannot be everywhere, you know, at the same time, so he delegates the parish priest. Now, I'd like to end up, if you want to really, really read about confirmation, you read the Acts of the Apostles. You know, in the New Testament, you have the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, followed by the second book that St. Luke wrote, the Acts of the Apostles. That is the life of the early church from the time where Jesus left, you know, during the day of his ascension. He had stayed 40 days with them after he rose from the dead. And he said, I'm going to leave you now, but you will receive the power from on high, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witnesses everywhere. They were scared. They were afraid. And so Jesus left them 40 days after his resurrection on the day of his ascension, and they got together. As I mentioned, keep mentioning, probably in a in a place called the Upper Room in Jerusalem, near the marketplace. 
So it was a big room like this, probably, that could hold up to 120 people. And Mary was with them, and some holy women. And they prayed for nine days with Mary. That was, as I told you, as told you, the first novena. That means praying nine days with Mary. And on the tenth day, that means the fiftieth day of the resurrection of Jesus, on the day of Pentecost, where thousands of Jews from all the Mediterranean countries were gathered for the feast of Jewish feast of Pentecost, as those, you know, disciples of Jesus with Mary were praying. All of a sudden, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and the doors were open, you know, the, the windows and doors, and boom, the Holy Spirit came on each one of them and appeared like tongues of fire. And they started speaking in unknown languages, speaking and, and singing. Remember, imagine 120 singing in in languages they didn't understand the languages given to them by the Holy Spirit. And all of those thousands gathered nearby in the marketplace heard them. Every group in his own language praying and, and, and proclaiming the glory and the praises of God. So that was the miracle of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit and then Peter stood up and he started, gave his first sermon. And those, to those thousands that were assembled, some of them said, well, you know, they're drunk. He says, how can we be drunk? It's only a three third hour in the morning. But it's the Holy Spirit. And he proclaimed Jesus. He said, Jesus, whom you have crucified, but you didn't know that he was the Lord of glory. God raised him from the dead. And now what you see is the Holy Spirit that God is, given, is, is giving to those who believe in Jesus and who repent from their sins. And that Holy Spirit could be given to you and to your children and to all the generations who will come after you. And many, 3,000 were converted. So that was the day of Pentecost. So the Acts of the Apostles speaks, they speak, speak about the life of the Christian community. And oftentimes, Paul and Peter, you know, Paul, we see the conversion of Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, and how he became, he became an evangelist. And Peter, who proclaimed the gospel to the Jews, and Paul who was sent to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And oftentimes, people, when they were converted, they were baptized, but some did not even hear about the Holy Spirit. So the church would send Peter or send Paul to lay hands on those who were baptized and ask the Holy Spirit to come on them. And as they, the, the apostles laid their hands on those who were baptized but who had not received the Holy Spirit yet, the Holy Spirit would fall on them. And in most of the instances, they, they had a very powerful experience. When the Holy Spirit came, they experienced the Holy Spirit. And they started speaking in an unknown language and prophesying. That was more or less of a sign that they have received the Holy Spirit. Now, so if you want to uh, see the Holy Spirit at work, I encourage you to read the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's a very fascinating book. Now there's a problem. You know, we've talked for more than an hour now about the Holy Spirit and the sacrament of confirmation. The Holy Spirit brings the holiness of God. He makes us proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We put all our lives under the Lordship of Jesus. He teaches us to pray the Holy Spirit. He fills us with God's love. He gives us strength to go and witness to Christ. But how come many people are confirmed? It's as if nothing has happened to them. And even some, you know, who are confirmed at the age of 14, you know, 
teenage boys and girls, they are confirmed and you don't see them at the church anymore. So much so that confirmation has been ridiculed and been called the sacrament of exit. People are confirmed and you don't see them at church anymore because they've received the document, you're confirmed. Now, you know, you're confirmed. But confirmation is not a document. Confirmation is, is becoming filled with the fire of God's love. The Holy Spirit, when He comes into your life, transforms you. He makes you, He gives you that desire to be like Christ. So how come people leave the church, we don't see them anymore after they get confirmed? It's a big problem. That means there's something deficient, there's something wrong in the way the confirmation is given. First, what is wrong is that often people are confirmed without <coughs> due, without adequate preparation. You know, I'm, I've spent more than an hour talking to you about confirmation. But those of you who need to be confirmed, you've been there from the beginning of our CIA. So we need first preparation in terms of understanding what are we going to become once we become Catholics. That means for those of you who are baptized already, you're going to be confirmed and receive the Eucharist. For those of you who are not yet baptized, you're going to be baptized, receive confirmation, and then receive the Eucharist. So you're being prepared. But preparation in terms of teaching is not enough. While I'm talking to you, as St. Augustine says, it's the Holy Spirit who's using my words to open your hearts and your minds to what you desire to be full-fledged Catholics, to be baptized, to be disciples of Christ, to be filled with God's power, God's love. While I'm speaking to you, I'm giving you the teaching, so I'm feeding your mind. The Holy Spirit is opening your heart. And if your heart remains closed, I can, you can be baptized, you can be confirmed, nothing happens. It's just a formula. It's just a document you receive. We won't see you in church. You don't give, you won't give a damn about living Catholic life. And then, at some point, you say, oh, being Catholic or not being Catholic is the same thing. So, because your heart was not ready, was not opened. There was no repentance. There's no desire of turning away from your old way of life to the new way, which is the way of Christ, the way of love, the way of truth, the way of self-sacrifice, the way of honesty, the way of, of peace, of joy. That is the way of a Christian. So you can be baptized, or you can be baptized and confirm nothing might happen. Why? Because you've received teachings in your head, but your heart was kept sealed, closed. So that is where, when people call confirmation the sacrament of exit, you know, the boys and the teenage boys and teenagers or adults can be prepared, they receive teachings, but it it went here, and oftentimes it got in here and went out. Or it got in here and stayed here. It didn't go inside deep. And so this is where, if you receive confirmation without experiencing, you know, in the early church, there are books and theses, doctoral theses having been written about how in the first 10 centuries people received baptism and confirmation. When they were confirmed people experienced 
deep joy because the Holy Spirit, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's like receiving the power, the fire of God in you. It cannot just be like a log of wood. Nothing is up. No. Some people, you know, shed tears, tears of joy. God gives you the gift of tears. Some people are so filled with, with, with holy joy inside. You know, sometimes they say, oh, I was confirmed, but nothing happened. Well, there must be something deficient here. You look, you go through the Acts of the Apostles. When the Apostles laid their hands on those who were baptized and they received the Holy Spirit, boy, they experienced it. Something happened in their lives that transformed them. Since, you know, the bishop comes, and you know, a teenager comes, they have been prepared either in prep or they've been to Catholic schools and they've received some teaching. And then the bishop speaks of, okay, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And you know, do you know the gifts that you're going to receive? Now, sometimes they know them by heart, but they know them here only. And then the bishop lays their hands on them, invokes the Holy Spirit, and puts holy oil, holy chrism on their heads says, be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Nothing happens. And the next day, they don't go to church anymore. I'm not saying that all of them do this. But there needs to be adequate pre pre preparation. There needs also to be conversion, openness of the heart and mind to want to become like Christ. Being confirmed is like being a soldier of Christ. You become a warrior. Now, I'm not talking about guys only. I'm talking about women. You become a warrior because you start realizing that there's a war. You are in a struggle. You know, the devil, the culture wants, they want to choke you to, to, to really smash any life of faith in you. So you realize that you are at a war. And you are at war against sin, first and foremost. And so, this is what confirmation means. If you get confirmed, if Father Pierre lays your hand on you and just puts Holy Chrism on you and says, be sealed with the Holy Spirit, you may receive the Holy Spirit objectively. But if you don't, if nothing changes inside, something, it says if the gift of the Holy Spirit is tied. So you have to to, to really want the Lord to transform you so that when you receive the Holy Spirit in confirmation, wow, you become a new creation. You become filled with the desire to be holy, to be a disciple of Christ, to be a witness of Christ, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that you can be like Jesus in everything you do, you say, you act. So that's the sacrament of confirmation. It's a very important and powerful sacrament. But it supposes or it presupposes an openness of heart and mind. If you receive things here, only teachings in your head, and your heart is not open, it won't do you anything. You can say, oh, I'm confirmed. And you are confirmed. But if there's no transformation, nothing that changes in your life, there's no greater holiness, greater love, you know, that means that what you receive has been, is still tied, you know. So this is where confirmation is so important to transform you, to make you like Christ. But you need to desire it. You need to open your heart and your mind. See, there's always those two dimensions. There's the objective dimension and there's the subjective dimension. When the bishop or the priest lays your hand on you, and when he anoints you with holy chrism and tells you be sealed with the Holy Spirit, objectively, you receive the Holy Spirit. But if subjectively your heart and mind is not open, the gift of the Holy Spirit is like tied. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't change your heart. So this is where you need to open up 
as St. Augustine says, the great St. Augustine, the early church father says, when I preach, when I teach, you know, my words goes to your head, and sometimes they enter here and they leave there, but if the Holy Spirit does not use my words to open your hearts and your minds, it's of no avail. Nothing happens. And so this is where your inner, your, your inner attitude is so important. Lord, I want to be holy. I'm a poor sinner. I'm hurt. I've hurt others. I have cheated. I've been angry. I hate. I've sinned. I've committed adultery. I've stolen. You know, I, I cursed. Give me awareness and awareness of my sinfulness. But I give, I surrender everything to you. When you have this attitude, the Holy Spirit can be really powerful in your life and can transform you. And you're ready for baptism, for confirmation, and for the Eucharist. Okay, so I'm now finished. It's 10 to 9. Now there's room for one or two or three questions if you want. Any question about the sacrament of confirmation? Now I do, again, repeat, I do encourage you to go back to your notes, to read the articles, to read the UCAT, and to pray the rosary every day. Start praying. Make it as a great habit. Don't wait till the end of the day when you've watched your sitcoms, your programs, when you've been to the internet, you went to Facebook, you chit-chatted with your friends, you watch some videos, you know, and you're so tired and so sleepy, and now I can pray. No, that's not the best moment to pray. You can say a small prayer, and you can make a small examination of conscience to fall asleep, but the best time to pray is when you're alert, when you're awake, so usually it's the morning before you go to work. But if you want to pray in the morning, you've got to learn to go to bed the night before early. If you go to bed at midnight, how do you expect to pray in the morning? You'll be tired and you'll have to go to work. So this is where you need to order your life so that prayer could take a good place. You you make room to God in your everyday life. The best time, as far as I'm concerned, for personal prayer is in the morning. Now you can go to Mass, but for those of you who cannot receive communion, you know, you're going to Mass and it's wonderful, it's beautiful, you receive lots of graces, but you can't receive the body of Christ. So, but you can pray. You can pray. And you can make yourself a small prayer corner in your bedroom or in, in your dining room or even in your kitchen if you want. No, well, not a kitchen, but, but just make it a prayer corner. Usually it doesn't have to be complicated. You get yourself a crucifix, not a simple cross, a crucifix where you see Christ dead and hanging on the cross. Why? Because you need to see him you need to understand that He died for my sins in order to give me His life, that I am to die for. So a crucifix with the body of Christ hanging there dead is very important. A Catholic Bible, a lighted candle, a rosary, and why not a small notebook? So when you start reading the, the Word of God, reading the Psalms, reading the Gospel passage, some verses, some words strike you as if God wanted to speak to you. I can write them down. Today, January 10th, as I was reading the Psalm or the Gospel passage, I, I had the sense that God was talking to me in His words, in this verse. So I'm writing it down and I'm dating it so that in, in one week or two, when I go back to it, I read it. Wow. So, this is when you pray, you pray for yourself, you pray for your family, you pray for your workplace, you pray for the world, you pray for the church. 
But you don't pray also ask, 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 ask. Ask things for God. It's important. But you learn also to thank Him, to praise Him. And one way to thank Him and praise Him is the Gloria. You know the prayer that we say or we sing on Sunday? Glory to God in the highest. We praise You. We glorify You. We give You thanks. You're a great God. It's, you, you're just you know, short of words to, to thank God, to glorify Him, to praise Him. That will teach you to praise Him. Not only to ask, 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 which is important, but also to thank Him. Say, thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself more and more. You're filling me with the desire to know you more, to love you more, to serve you more. That's the best thing you can do. Now, if you do all this, 15 minutes are gone very quickly. Sometimes half an hour. See, I prayed half an hour. I can't believe it. And I'm not bored. Wow. And if you get excited, and every day you want to repeat the same experience, daily prayer becomes part and parcel of your life. And that's very important.